Yeah, we can hear you. Good afternoon once again. I'm Oscar Kokwajima, as we all know. Today is our last webinar for the year, and I just want to share with you on systematic leisure review. So let me share my screen with you. Yeah, I'm bad at machine. Okay. Okay, I best screen. Okay, okay, that's fine. So Yeah, it's okay. You can all see it. Yes, you can see your screen. Okay. So when you talk about systematic leisure review, this is not something new that's you no. Know, we are talking about is something that have been in the system from the 16th and the 17th to the 19th century, and we have been using it. But sure, can you see me? I can't see myself on the screen. Is it okay? You are not yes. going to see yourself, but we can see. You. <laughs> but you can, we can see. see you, so don't worry. Okay. You are yes. not supposed to see yourself. Okay, so, <laughs> you, but <Bashiro. Okay. laughs> <laughs> You want to see yourself at the same time, man. Eh? I just want to know how your, the output will be. But as but you know. Okay, so as I said, as I said, the systematic leisure review is not something new. It has been in the system from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century downwards. And it was mainly used by the, the, the scientists, those in the medical field. And now we, the social scientists and other disciplines, have also borrowed it. And it came to the known, and people, you know, got chance on it during the COVID time. That is where people got to know more about this systematic review. Because people were not able, with, because of the fiscal quantum were reduced, people were not able to go to the field to gather primary data. So they then think about how they are going to gather gather systematic data or gather empirical data, analyze it, and still come out with inferences that will help the discipline and also help to fill the gap in literature and in knowledge. So that's when the little history about the systematic literature review. So when you talk about the systematic literature review or the SLR, that's commercial people, so pardon me for that. It identifies, select, and critical appraise research in order to answer a clearly formatted question. Here, what we are talking about is that it's not just a review. We will come to a bachelor where the and the to be admitting them, but I think we have already done so. Uh, yes, but yeah, so, uh -huh, so, so, um, yeah, next make bachelor co host. You can make Basil no, co-host. Yeah, he can't. He can't make me co-host because of uh, the setting. Okay, okay. I can. I can make you. I think there is a room for make host. So I think. Yeah. That, so you can make, make you. You can make me co-host. Yeah. So I've, that you be admitted. Yeah. I've make it. I've make you host. So you can admit in them. For it to be interacting with me here. So I'll make you a host. Yes, you I can see that Basil is another host. So yeah, Basil can so admit. You can admit. Okay, so sorry for that interaction. As I said, so going forward, we will learn the difference between the systematic literature review and the traditional literature review that we know. Oh, okay. yeah, some more. The internet means this table. Hmm. But I hope we can all hear from me. Hello? Yeah, we can hear from you. Okay. We can hear from you. Okay, then let's go on. So the systematic literature review that we know is a method, it's a, pro, it's a protocol, it's a process of deriving knowledge of the literature, aggregating it, reviewing it, synthesizing it. So we'll be hearing that word, synthesize. That's the key thing when you talk about the systematic literature review. So when you talk about the systematic literature review here, we are looking at how we can reduce the bias that is found in the traditional literature review the rationale, the hypothesis, the method of data collection are being prepared. All what we are saying here is that the way systematic here to, you know, to differentiate between the traditional literature review, we are looking at the systematic, 
We are not just reviewing any literature anyhow, as normally happens in our traditional literature. But this one, we are going through a systematic way, a pragmatic measures, in such a case that we want to reduce the bias. We want to gather relevant data. We want to answer a specific research question. So basically, that's how systematic literature review works. So we will be taking you through the processes that we have in the systematic review. For now, we can say that we have the qualitative and quantitative nature. Or systematic review can be in the qualitative or quantitative nature. And in the science or in the medical field, they use a tool called PICO. And we have the small letter for P, I, C, O. We will come to that. We have time to look at what it means and how it works. So according to Pitway 2008, he outlines seven key principles behind systematic literature review. And he is saying that any systematic literature review should be transparent. There should be transparency, clarity, integration, focus, equality, accessibility, and coverage. With the transparency, this is what we are talking about. You should be able to document the process that you have embarked on in selecting this research or the literature that we have so that anyone can also follow set steps or set measures to arrive at a similar or the same result. And this one will help with regard to the validity and the reliability of the data. And the clarity, we are talking about the objective, it should be clearly stated or defined. Then there should be integration. The literature review that we are going to review, because you are going to you know, take through a systematic process and a review, you the, the, the data should be integrated. The review should be integrated. Said that the data should sync together. You shouldn't have one data sitting else where then the another data or literature will be sitting other way and it can't synchronize. Then we are looking at focus. Your literature review should be focused on a particular team. That is the research question. Then there should be accessibility. The research that we are talking about, then coverage. You can look at it from the scope. You can have a broader scope or a narrow scope, depending on how in-depth you want your literature review to be. So we will come to that in our next slide. So we are looking at some characteristics of systematic literature review. And as uh, uh, the author in 2008 clearly stated, that it should be clearly defined. The objective or the research question that we are talking about should be clearly defined. Then we should have explicit predefined criteria for inclusion and exclusion of the literature review. As we are saying, this is not just the traditional literature review. So in doing it, you have to clearly state your criteria of inclusion and criteria of exclusion. So you have to plan before you start this journey. Then if you have that, then you, you then determine your set strategy. You look at all these things. These are all part of the process that we have in the systematic literature review. So we will look at them as uh, individual components. So you look at your set strategy. How are you going to set for the uh, literature review? Where are you going to search and when? What period are you going to involve in this study? We look at it. Then there should be a systematic evaluation of the quality of studies included in the review. After you have searched for the articles or the literature, how are you going to include one or the other literature and how are you going to exclude it? You have to systematically evaluate all this literature that you have so that you know that I'm including this literature because of these reasons. I'm excluding this literature because of that reason. So you don't just include any literature and you don't just exclude any literature from your review. Then you look at the identification of the excluded source of literature. As I said, you justify, you give reasons why you are excluding a certain literature from your review. You don't just exclude it because you feel like, no, you are going through a systematic approach. Then the seven state or the characteristics, you analyze or you synthesize the information. You compare the results. 
That one, we have the qualitative synthesis and we have the quantitative. When you talk about the quantitative here, you'll be looking at the meta analysis or the metadata analysis. You look at that one. Then lastly, you look at your references. And there is a software for this. So in all, we can say that the key characteristics of a systematic review are one, two. Can we define your question? You look at that one as a component. Then you look at the rigorous and systematic set of literature, critical appraise or analyze the literature that you are going to include. Then you manage it. Then last, you look at the analysis and the interpretation of the result. That's the synthesis. Then finally, you report on your results that you give your conclusion and a recommendation. So these are a few characteristics of a systematic literature review. Please, any question after this stage? Please, anything, any contribution? No, you can continue, please. Okay. It, it, yes, any other person? Hello? Okay, let's Maybe continue. if there's a concern, yeah. Okay, later on, if there is any concern, I think it will yeah. Yeah. Then let's look at some few limitations. We can't praise the systematic literature review without highlighting some few challenges. No, there is this way, there's nothing that we you do that you wouldn't have these challenges and other things. So let's look at few challenges. The, 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 the first one is outdated or risks of bias. And this one, Cochrane studies, people have identified this as challenges. And especially in the medical field, if you are to analyze literature review, it shouldn't be more than 18 months. Because sometimes you look at the currency of the information. For instance, now we are in the COVID era and people are publishing on COVID. So if you want to publish anything on leisure review or systematic leisure review concerning COVID, it should be between this period, at least three months, six months, because that information will guide us on what to do. And it should be current. You can go and gather different data or maybe a pandemic data that's happened maybe 30 years, 40 years, there may be a reason for it. But what we are saying that the data shouldn't be outdated and there shouldn't be a, a, a bias in your data. Then the second one, you look at the scope. It's saying that the, there is a limited reporting of clinical uh, trends or data from human studies. Here, what we are trying to mean is that because there is no clear criteria of the scope, whether to go the narrow way or to go the broad way. So some people will just look at the narrow way and they report as if there is nothing else that has been done. So what we are saying there is that sometimes the systematic literature review can be limited or they can be small inside or the scope can be limited. Then we are looking at the third one is poor compliance with review reporting guidelines. As I said, and as we, we, we got to know, according to the other author in the 28, he said that there should be transparency for validity and reliability sake. There should be transparency, and there should therefore be documentation of these processes. So in order to review and report appropriately, there is a systematic way, but at times people don't follow it systematically or religiously, and that's one of the bias or the, the, the challenges of systematic literature review. Then going forward, there have been some suggestions on how these errors or these challenges can be tackled with. So people have come out with robust, that's the risk of bias in systematic review, and start to, that's the measurement to assess the methodological quality of systematic review. Then our almighty Prisma, now the, we have the Prisma S, we will take Time to look at the prisma, what goes in the prisma diagram. And if you are able to follow set measures, you'll be able to reduce these challenges or this limitation regarding the systematic literature review. I'm now looking at the difference between the literature review, then the meta analysis, then narrative. Here, yeah, when you look at the meta-analysis, as I indicated earlier, we are looking at a, 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 a statistical techniques for combining the findings from disparate quantitative studies. Here, 
when you look at the synthesis process, is a quantitative way of synthesizing results or literature from different authors or different studies. So normally they use statistical methods to evaluate, synthesize, and summarize these results. For instance, you can use R, you can use Stata to analyze maybe comment from Twitter and other social media platforms. So that one we call it the meta analysis. You take time to go through really what the meta analysis is about. Then the later review, the narrative one. Here, what we are saying here is that it is a broad term referring to reviews with a scope and the non standardized methodological way. Here is like the traditional later review that we have, but this one is in a chronological manner since there is a narrative. So you can see that the person narrated, it can be, the chronological manner can be from maybe time dimension or historical. So maybe from 1990, from 2000, 2010, 2020, how things have been happening, maybe at the medical field or at the viral, uh, virology, they can look at that period. Then other etymology, those who want to study about maybe the way people live and the history and culture of people, they can also look at that's from maybe Ashanti Kingdom before they became recently the chief from Brown who tried to you know give some account about Ashanti. So you can try to look at that from maybe before they became Asante and when they became Asante, then after Asante Kingdom and the fall of Asante and other one. That one is also narrative. But when you we, we are going to look at the rare difference between the later review and the systematic review. Anything, I think someone wanted to say something. No, you can continue, please. I, okay. I was talking to someone, please, sorry. Okay, so with the, with the, we want to differentiate clearly between the systematic literature review and the literature review, that's the traditional literature review that we have. So here, the first criteria that we are looking at is the review question, and mind you, Review question, or some people can put it as the reset objective, is the main thing when it comes to the systematic review. Before you can plan about systematic review, you should clearly come out with your reset question or your review question. So we said that it begins with a well-defined reset question to be answered by the review. So that is it. But when you talk about the traditional literature review here, we are just looking at it from the scope or the goal of the review is to place one's own research within the existing body of knowledge. So clearly define answerable question. Here we can present it in things, maybe causes of HIV, effects of HIV, then maybe measures to keep HIV or teenage pregnancy. That one is in just teams. But with a systematic review, you want to ask questions that will drive the review. And the question will determine what happens at each stage of the review. Then searching for studies. With this one, the traditional one, you just search on Google Scholar, you just search on anything concerning this team that you are looking for. So you don't assess the quality and other things. But with a systematic review, attempts are being made to find all existing published and unpublished literature review on the recent question. But with the traditional literature review, we just review any information that you find online. Whether you are exhaustive or what, you just care about the voluminous of the information that you have or the content. If you, you, you feel like it's adequate, that's all. But here, you want to review on the published and the unpublished articles or literature concerning the research question. Then, with the study selection, he said that often it lacks clear reason for choosing or excluding a particular study. As I said, a traditional literature review, you can just set on, for example, the team that I indicated earlier, maybe cause of HIV, effect of HIV, or cause of teenage pregnancy. So you search on it, any article that you have, you review it, the information that you have, it is enough or adequate, you just write on it. But with the systematic review, you need to clearly state the criteria of inclusion and exclusion, and why you are including or excluding a particular literature review or a particular article from your review. Then, 
The other criteria is quality access. How you are going to assess the quality of the literature that you have. With a traditional one, normally you don't consider it. And the potential biases in the study design, you don't consider it. But with a systematic review, you really assess the risks of bias of individual studies and overall quality of evidence. Then here you look at the heterogene heterogeneity. Here you want to know the differences between or among the various studies. Sometimes people can even study similar topic or similar phenomena and come up with different or diverse inferences or conclusion. That's what we, 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 we seem to assess to see whether similar studies will even come out or yield different results or yield similar results. Here, in the systematic review, assess such information. Then we look at synthesis of existing research. Here with the traditional literature review, what we are saying that the conclusions are more qualitative and may not be based on the study quality. However, with the systematic review, conclusions are based on the quality of the existing literature that we have. And we also provide recommendations that help to address the knowledge or the, 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 the gap in knowledge. Then the lastly, we look at the goal. The goal of the literature review, that's the traditional one, that one answers a focused research question and it eliminates biases. But here it provides summary of overall. And what we are saying is that the goal of a literature review is just to provide answers or maybe just summarize a team or a phenomena. But with a systematic review, the goal is to summarize, synthesize the ideas or the findings that we have in our study and also help us to answer the research question of the study. So here, the key thing come back to the review question, which stems or which begins the study when you talk about the systematic review. So basically, these are the differences that we have between the systematic nature review and the traditional nature review that we have. Then going forward, we want to look at the processes. When you talk about the systematic nature review, as I indicated earlier, it talk about processes. It follow a systematic approach. Bajiru. Hello, Bash. Yeah, what time? Yes, I asked you. Okay, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. Okay, thank you. Ah, uh, so you can continue. Yeah. Okay. So let me look at this. Then, with the approach or the, the process that we have, you will find it in different literature. Some have six, some have seven, some have eight, some have nine, some have seven, some have six. But basically, they are just synonyms or change of words and other things. But these are the summaries of the various processes that we have. And we need to understand them. That's the key thing. Because you can't do any systematic literature review without passing through basically some of these processes. So you see that some of the processes cut across all the processes that we have. So we will take them one after the other then we explain it. So for instance, looking at the first one, we have the define research question. That is, that is the key. When you're talking about systematic literature review, we will look at the research question. It, it's key. So you can see that it, it runs through all the places that we have. Then the second one, look at define the methodology. So that one, the person has summarized about two or three steps and make it methodology. So you look at that one. Then third, retrieve the eligible literature. Four, to assess the quality of the choosing literature. Then fifth, to identify information and portray the findings. Then the sixth and the last one is to write a synthesis of the results. However, Iga Itzel 2008, also stipulated the various processes that we need to pass through or follow in conducting a systematic literature review. So according to Iga, that one, you first have to formulate a research question. 
That is very key. Then you define inclusion and exclusion criteria. Then you locate studies. Fourth one, you select studies. Fifth one, you assess the quality of these literatures that you have selected. Then the sixth one, you extract data from these literatures that you have selected and assess the quality. You extract the data from it. Then the seventh one is to analysis. That's the data analysis. You analyze the data that you have extracted. Then you present the results. Then the eighth is to interpret your results. So ladies and gentlemen, these are the various processes that we have when you want to conduct systematic literature review. But aside all these processes that we have, what I can add up or I can say is that before you embark on these processes, you need to plan at each and every stage. You need to plan and have your form or have your evaluation form, how you are going to evaluate this process. That's very key. Any question, any submission, anything concerning these processes? Hello? Yeah, hello, Oscar. There is hello. No hand up. Yeah. You can go ahead. Okay, then let's take these processes and exhaust them. The first stage, that's the to define the research question. This is the first stage to identify the research question. The review should fill a knowledge gap. This is the first thing that it has to be in your mind or the back of your mind that the systematic literature review that you are going to conduct at the end of the day, if you find solution or answer to the research question, it should also help you to fill a knowledge gap or gap in literature. And this question that you are going to formulate, you look at the scope, the scope can be broad or narrow, as I said, depending on the comprehensive, how detailed you want to conduct your systematic literature review. Sometimes if you look at the broad scope, it will help because you'll be able to gather enough literature and based on that literature, you can make your inferences. And when you make your inferences, it will stand the test of time and the methodological issue. However, maybe due to time and other issues, you can also go the narrow way and still come out with robust results or findings. Then in the medi medical field, as I said, the sciences, they look at the PICO. And the PICO, the P here means population, patient, or the problem that you want to find out. These are all the things that you should consider in coming out with a research question. You shouldn't just come out because, because you just want to study something about maybe because of HIV. No. You should think about all these things before you come out with a research question. Then you look at the intervention. The intervention specifies the investigation aspect. You let's bring this scenario so that we understand the people. For instance, let's look at the COVID-19 now we have now. So the problem or the population and the patient that we are looking at is the is the what do you call the the the, the populace, the citizens of Ghana. Let's look at Ghana. So the intervention, what is the intervention that we, we are having now? The vaccine is the intervention. So people want to inject. Then we come to the comparison. What are you compelled? Now, what they are comparing is those who have been vaccinated or injected, and those who haven't been vaccinated or injected. These are the two people that we have in the world. Then the outcome. So those that have been vaccinated, what is the outcome? Is it that they are prevented from the, 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 the COVID-19, from being infected from COVID-19? Or some are saying that they have, what do you call it, some complications as, as a result of this being uh, vaccinated. That's the, the, the effect. Then with a small PICO, that will look at the context, the certain the environment in which we are investigating. So here we are talking about Ghana. We are injecting people in Ghana. So we are looking at Ghana alone. So these are the issues when you go to the medical field. These are the things that they think about before they come out with the research question. Then we have other 
a point that they use like spider, then the PEO. The PEO is normally used when they want to reset or they want to ask questions about causes or risks. So that when they look at the population or the patient, then they look at the exposure. The, the, the people that are exposed, what are they exposed to? So maybe people living in Atonso, maybe you want to study something about maybe the gas, the, the explosion of gases and how it affects their, their living or their health. You want to look at how, who are those exposed and what are they exposed to? Then the outcome, what are the effects? However, when it comes to the social sciences, we have other things that we also consider. So that one, because we want to find solution and we want to review in order to fill a knowledge gap, you have to review the literatures and find out that maybe this area is a gray area. Nothing much has been done about it. Then you conduct a systematic review. And mind you, the systematic review is not only about country based. Like you want to find out you review literatures concerning Ghana alone. No, it can be worldwide, but that knowledge can be applicable to Ghana. That's why you are reviewing this literature. So some characteristics of a good research question. Here we are saying that research questions should be meaningful and should be important to practitioners and researchers. Then it should lead to change in current practice or increase the confidence in the value of current practice. This one has to do with the metadata analysis and with the medical field. Then third, the research questions should identify discrepancies between the commonly beliefs and the reality. Maybe there is a known that maybe people of Atonso is being exposed to a certain gases. But when you read into literature, then you get to know what is the reality, what is it really happening. Then you will be able to differentiate the difference between what they believe and what is in the reality. Excuse me. Then the research question reveals new insight, the challenges, the shortcomings. That's why it shouldn't be just repetitive repetition of what is known already no it should be something new that will come out with inferences or conclusions or recommendations that will help us to find solution to knowledge gap or gap in literature then the research question should also help to find answers to recent gap or knowledge as already indicated so at the first stage this is what we are thinking about the research question and the research question will drive the rest of the process. So it's very key. <coughs> Excuse me. It's very key. And it should be clearly stated to avoid any uh, ambiguity. It should be clearly stated. Then let's look at the next thing. That one is to define your a criteria of exclusion and inclusion. As I said, because this finite basis in the medical science, so most of the processes are very familiar with the sciences and the medical researchers. Because in social science and other disciplines, normally they don't even state in their research the criteria of exclusion and inclusion, but other people do, especially with the sciences and the medical field. I know they do. So they are familiar with this. So here, what we are saying is that you should clearly set some, 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 some reasons, some criteria for you. You, you, should, you should be able to set some criteria upon which you'll be able to judge and see that this study should be included in the review, that study should be excluded in the review, and all this should be based on the research question. However, what we are saying is that the criteria of inclusion and the exclusion process is a multi-stage. It's not just a directional stage. So sometimes it should be piloted because it's a back and forth. However, it should be guided by a plan, by a criteria. For instance, you want to conduct the issue with the maybe the willingness of the people to maybe participate in uh, this COVID-19, the injection or the vaccine, we want to find out how people are willing and other stuff. With the 
literature you want to include in your study, you have to clearly state it. What literatures are you going to include and why? And what literatures are you going to exclude and why? These things should be done. As I say, every stage you should plan about it. You should get a, a form or a criteria. Maybe the later that we are talking about, it should say something about a uh, vaccination. It should say something about COVID. It should say something about willingness. So these are your set terms that you use it to include the articles or the literature. But what about the exclusion criteria? Maybe any literature that says something about maybe is though it's person, but those that say something about maybe polio injection and other thing is not concerned with the review. So I will exclude it. Those who that study something that is maybe you look at the time that I mentioned, maybe from 2000 to 2010, that one is not needed. You exclude it. So we say that this serves as a basis for selecting research articles. So your criteria of exclusion and criteria of inclusion, you can even look at the age-wise. Some study will want to look at maybe babies or maybe children under five or they want to consider only children under five or only adults. Because now we know that the person, they, they, uh, uh, they started with the adult people. So we want to look at that one. So here you are not concerned about the children and those below five years, you don't consider them. So these are all criteria that you need to state them. It's not that it's in my mind, no. Because we have to let the process be transparent for validity and reliability and for reputation sake, I, 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 I seek. Then we move on to the next stage. The next stage we are looking at set strategy. You are now going to set your literature but Now you have your criteria of inclusion and criteria of exclusion. Uh, what are you are going to include and what you are going to exclude. Okay, after that one, what happens? We say that the, the, the search strategy or the search process is it involves a comprehensive and exhaustive setting of studies to be included in your study. Here, people may consult subject librarian. Like you see, I quite remember I was doing something on this later. I consulted the librarian that I want lectures concerning this area. So they would download lectures concerning that area and send it to me. Then I still look through them and then I will decide which one to include and to exclude. So sometimes you need to consult a subject librarian because here you want to download or you want to get access to even published and unpublished literatures. It's very key. You want to get as voluminous and as many as you want before you then assess the quality of the literature in the next stage. So as I said, it's not one stage, it's a multi-stage and it involves a lot of strategies and you need to then define your strategy how you are going to search so some can even come up with terms in your research question like what you just have maybe willingness of the people in maybe injection or vaccinated so one the third term is willingness you are looking at vaccine or vaccination then you are looking at COVID-19 so maybe you have three terms that you are going to search so you search through these studies or these literatures with these three things. Then we have another thing called bullying search. Here we use those words like and, or, or not. And these words can help you to even you know, search for exact literature that you need. Then you can also use truncation and white cards. Sometimes you can use certain words. If there are some words and they are feminine use, you have to specify it. If there are some words they are meant for, maybe they are masculine, you need to specify it. And the, the search will help you to have, uh, the search engines will help you to find it. And even in Google search, you can go to the advanced and still state some criteria for it and can help you to limit the number of literatures that you have. It's very important. Very important. Then, so looking at this one, we see that the search strategy defined. Here, we are looking at some aspect or some issue that we need to consider when you are looking at your search strategy. First one, you look at which approach to be used. Are you going to go by the manually 
or the automatic uh, database? Or are you going to include only published articles or you want to include published and the unpublished article? Which way, which approach do you want to find? Or which approach do you want to go with? So here you, de you decide. Then after that, you look at where? Repositories, where do you want to find this database or this literature you are talking about? Maybe some are interested in library. They want to go to hybrid libraries or maybe traditional library to find out their literature, fine. Some are also interest, interested in the online databases and maybe broadcasts. So those interested in the online databases and broadcasts, we look at some database like Cochrane Database or Library, Google Scholar, Physic Info, PubMed, Web of Science, Science Direct, then other uh, uh, conference, proceedings etc so these are all repositories or databases that you can find leisure that you need for your subjects of review then you look at what subject evidence what exactly do you want to search for these are all ways that you want to query the databases that will help you to find some literature concerning the area you want to study or the area you want to review like the vaccination covid then willingness. Then when is the search carried out? What time span to be set? As I have already explained, the time span. If you are looking at something about COVID only, you are talking about maybe from 2019, 2020, 2021. These are the period in which the COVID has surfaced. So we want to look at articles that were published concerning vaccination, concerning willingness, and other thing within this time span so it's very important so you develop your set strategy so these are the strategies that we are going to find out okay willingness what is another term for willingness sometimes you can use synonyms and other things to you know search you can also try that way so these are all the processes that you these are the strategy that you develop in searching for your literature so we move on to the next one or stay on the structure, you want to look at other ways that we can also still search. <coughs> These are complement to the search strategy. We are looking at forward snowballing. The word snowballing is normally used when in sampling and other places where it's difficult to come by your sampling, uh, your target population. So here too, when you are conducting a study on area that is gray area that is limited in literature, you have only few literatures around, you normally employ the snowballing approach. Here we have the forward snowballing and the backward snowballing. The forward one, this is what we mean by the forward snowballing. You are to identify articles that have been cited, that have cited the articles found in the search that you are talking about. This is how it is. For instance, as I said, you want to set about willingness of people in accepting the vaccination and other stuff. So you first search, then you find an oh, Oscar Pokwa might have published something about willingness of maybe Kumasi people in accepting the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. So that one, then you look at other literatures that have cited my work. So when you type my name, Oskopoku, at my own willingness and other other people's work will, will follow. Then you look through them. Those that cited me, that means they have something concerning willingness. They have something concerning vaccination. So you download their articles and include them. That's the forward snowballing. Then the backward snowballing. Here, what we are talking about is you identify articles from the reference list. So like the Oskopoku on Ashante region or maybe people of Kumase regarding willingness to assert the person and other stuff. You download my article, you get into the article, then you go to the reference section, then you find out other articles. Because normally, because I'm writing something about willingness, vaccination and other things, the literature that I will also consult will have something to do with vaccination, wellness, and the COVID-19. Therefore, you will then go through their uh, reference list and identify some literatures 
then you go and search for them. These are all ways of, you know, searching for literature. As I said, searching is a critical part of conducting the systematic review, as it provides the evidence-based research. Incomplete searches leave you open to bias results. As I said, if you don't search in depthly and adequately, so that you'll be able to include most or the majority of the literature that you need to consider, your study will be open to a lot of biases. So therefore, we are saying that it should be comprehensive and unbiased. And it should be clear and reproducible. As I said, the process that we are going, you have to document it. Said so that any person can go through this approach and come up with a similar finding. And you should be able to, you know, adequately and comprehensive cover majority or large portion of the literature so that your inferences, your conclusions wouldn't be open to a lot of biases. So what we are saying here is that the process of conducting the systematic literature review must be transparent and replicable. Therefore, review should be documented in sufficient detail. So all these processes at each stage you need to document what happened at each stage, so that people can follow similar process and come up with a similar findings or the same finding. However, we have other softwares that can help you to manage your references. So we have the Mendeley, we have Microsoft in the Microsoft Word, we have Rev, Twitterville, and other software that we can use to manage our bibliography or references. Mind you, there is difference between bibliography and references. The broker can be just any literature that you have read, any literature that you have come about that you may or may not include in your work. That's the program. But reference concerned with only literatures that you have used in your work or you started them in your work, then you have to reference them. That's the difference between them. So we are saying that this process is very exciting. We are talking about the, the, the next thing that the select uh, studies. Here, yeah, it's very exciting, but it can be also time consuming. However, we have two basic steps that we employ or we utilize in coming out or giving you the mandate and the, 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 the obligation for you to be able to select the study or the article or the literature you need. First thing is the use of titles and abstracts. Here, you look at the article that you have downloaded. The, 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 the general title or the title of the article should even tell you about what the article is all about. If the title is not enough, you go to the abstract because the abstract is the summary. It gives you the snapshot of the research process. So you scan through the title, then you scan through the abstract, then you get to know whether the, the research or the article or the literature is, 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 is valuable or is valuable or maybe is important for your review. However, if this project is not enough, then you move this the second stage. <coughs> Excuse me. If this project is not enough, then you move to the second stage. That's the, the reading of the full text is very voluminous and very time consuming. So sometimes you need to scan through the whole text or the full text to know whether the article is very important for your review or not. So just basic two steps will help you to select a particular literature and to decide whether to include a particular literature or not. So this has a process, this has a link with a, you know, as it's the process, it's the systematic, so it has a link with the criteria of inclusion and criteria of exclusion after that stage and your search strategy, then you will then decide whether the literature you have you want to include it or not. Then if you gather your data, then you are looking at the data extraction. After you have selected your literature that you you want, you need to so, okay, I have about 150 literatures. I have downloaded about 300 articles or literature from the various databases. Okay, upon scanning through the abstract, the title, and the full text, I've now realized that maybe I need 150 articles, or 150 articles is very good for my 
or it's important for my rate yield. So now you are taking the 150. You are now going to extract data from the 150. So this is very key stage because all the stage that we have, we are trying to look at how we will be able to, you know, uh, retrieve the quality data that we have. And this is very key. So data need to be extracted from the individual studies in a systematic way to ensure reliability and validity. However, according to Quokkan Hambu, he said that to construct easy to use forms and collect sufficient and important data that will faithfully represent the source in a structure and organized manner. As I indicated earlier, all this process that we are talking about, it shouldn't be isolation uh, in isolation to be in a systematic order, it should be in a process. And all these processes must be documented. That's very key. It is common to find several published articles of the same study. Multiple reports need to be avoided, counting save data several times. Here, what we are meaning is that, or what it means is that, some studies, it can be possible that we may have multiple reports from similar studies or we may have similar results from different studies or similar studies. However, if you are able to read it and extract the data adequately and meaningfully, you'll be able to you know, remove this multiple report. So when this one happened, what you do is that sometimes you, you compare those reports, the one that is completely and adequately reported, you pick that one. And sometimes you also look at the currency, then there maybe there are two uh, different studies that came out with a similar report or same report. Then you look at the currency. Which one is current? Then you pick that one. Then you should also collect database on a protocol or research plan. As I said, at each stage, you should have a plan for it. So if you want to extract data, you should have a plan. That maybe if I have this kind of data, one is saying that maybe Okay, like the willingness of the people. Somehow I've just con I conducted maybe in January to find out the willingness of the people to accept the vaccine. That was by then. By, by now, maybe someone have also conducted another study concerning the same willingness. However, you may pick the one who have conducted the study in December because the, the person is now in and people are now vaccinated. So you can then really check and see whether people are really willing to be vaccinated or not. So you look at the currency. And all these things, we, are, we have also the, the prisma table, the, the, the diagram flow. It will also help us to you know, summarize all this article that we are talking about. In our next slide, we look at how the prisma diagram or the flow chart, you know, how it, it looks like. It, it gives us a summary of all this project that we are talking about. Then what we are saying at this stage, it involves reading full text article or material or the literature. Here, you are not just going to scan through, but you are going to read the article so that you'll be able to find out the methodology, the rare findings of the study. Then you will do the data extraction from the primary study. Mind you, all this systematic literature review that we are talking about is mainly on primary research or primary studies. We are not talking about secondary studies. We are talking about primary studies. That is key. So make sure in your criteria of exclusion and inclusion, you then state all the secondary data or the secondary studies will be ignored, unless maybe for a special reason. Because systematic literature review deals with primary studies. Then also we collect all information that can be used to answer the research question. So the data that you are extracting, <coughs> excuse me, you extract the data that is meaningful, that will help you to answer the research question that you have in your first stage. You don't just gather any data. So any data that has nothing to do with the research question, you ignore it. Then what is said that for validation stage, for validation stake, I say, a set of papers should be reviewed by two or more researchers. Sometimes for us to have, you know, 
reliability and validity of the data. After going through this process, you can also give it to another researcher or two or more researchers to also go through similar things. That's why you need to document. So you have to document everything adequately. Then you tell the person, oh, I use this process, I use this thing, I use that, that, I use this criteria, I use that criteria to do this at this stage, at that stage. So the best one to pass through that stage and go through it and come out with a similar or different finding. Then you compare so that you know that they really your, your, your process were able to capture or come out with this kind of findings or inference. So as I said, this is the Prisma 2009 flow diagram. This is how it looked like. So it has the division one, two, three, four. That's the identification stage, screening, eligibility, and included. So this flow gives us the overall, how the articles, the number of articles that were downloaded or maybe that were retrieved from the various uh, uh, repositories or databases. Then you talk about the screening stage, what happens, how many were reviewed, how many were removed from it. Then you talk about the, about the eligibility stage. How many were eligible? How many articles were eligible or qualified to be added or included in the review? Then you look at the, the, the included. Maybe there was another criteria there. So let's take them one after the other. So at the, at the education stage, we have records identified through database searching. So here the M is 569. Then you have another one. You said that additional records identified through other sources. So this one was through database searching. Then other sources was only one. Then the database uh, database searching was 569. So now we have 570 articles or 570 literatures. So that was the identification stage. Right? Then we move on to the screening stage. That's where the, the, the the criteria of exclusion and the criteria of inclusion is found. So here it said that records after records after duplicates removed. So there were some duplicates. So going through it because maybe you you have published article in UUC database and you have published the same article or maybe you have recorded your 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 thesis in the R repository and out of it you are going to publish in different database or movement or maybe science direct or web of science. So the same information will be captured there. So you need to remove those duplicates. So after the removing of the duplicate, we have 388. Then it came down to the record screen, then record excluded. So after screening it, after the duplication were removed, we also screen it by using the criteria of exclusion and exclusion. So we have 340 articles being excluded. Are you guessing the 388 articles that is left now? We have 340 being excluded. So now, full test article assessed for eligibility. So now we have 48 articles at the eligibility stage. So that one is that full test article excluded. So we have 28 articles being excluded and why this is the reason for it as a reason including vascular dementia duplication no di diagnosis criteria improper comparison control irrelevant to outcome of this study or outcome not available so this were the criteria of inclusion and the criteria of exclusion we will go to what we call data quality access so it is out of the data quality that they were able to assess that they have duplication, maybe the methodology has an issue, and the outcome of the study were not also available. Therefore, they excluded 28 articles at that stage. So now, we have 20 articles remaining now. So studies included in the qualitative synthesis. So we have 20 articles. So the 20 articles are the quality ones, are the one that has something to do with the research question is the one that the data in it is fully adequate and the methodology is fully understood they have specified the methodology how they chose the participants and the sampling techniques how they employ the the the, 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 the experimental group and other things so 
The final say we have studies included in the quantitative synthesis. That's the meta data analysis. They are also 20. So in all, it started with the 570 articles. But now we have only 20 quality articles that were used for the final data analysis. That's the synthesis. I, I hope you are with me. So this is the prisma. So this flow diagram given is summarize the whole process up to the synthesis where we are going to analyze the data and come out or extract the data and come out with the findings. So this table or this diagram or flowchart have been able to summarize all this process and now we are good to go. So we are looking at the quality, as I said. The quality here relates to the extent to which the study minimized bias and maximize internal and external validity. When you talk about the validity and the reliability, we are looking at the validity to look at how, whether the instrument were able to measure what it's supposed to measure. That's the validity. So if you have weighing scale, whether the weighing scale was able to measure the, the weight of the object. Then reliability look at the consistency in that measurement. So the quality here, we want to provide more detail on inclusion and the exclusion criteria. They want to check whether the quality difference provided an explanation for difference in the study. As a means of weighing the importance of the individual studies, when results are being you know, extracted. Here, what we mean is that the quality checking, we want to look at the individual research, their contribution to the review, for studies, may, uh, some studies may contribute higher than the others because some will be of a higher quality. And this will also help us in the interpretation of the findings and also determine the strength of the inferences that we have from the review. So in assessing the quality of studies, <coughs> these are the key areas that we consider. Mind you, this project is very also important, whether we are conducting our traditional literature review or this systematic literature review, how to assess the quality of your literature or your article is very important. You look at the methodology or the design of the study. Is the methodology appropriate? Because you can't be conducting maybe quantitative study and your methodology is looking at qualitative uh, issues. So it, you have to determine or examine whether the methodology of the study is appropriate. Then with that one, you also look at whether the sampling process was also appropriate, that the, the sample was even adequate for the study, how the sample were drawn as a sampling technique. You look at all these issues. Then the, the other issue you consider is the analysis of the study finding. Because sometimes you are conducting quantitative analysis, but the person will tell you is using discrete stars. So you look at the data analysis, whether adequate or appropriate analytical tools were employed or not. It's very important. Then you check the quality, the quality checklist. As I said, at each stage, there should be a form, there should be a plan. So here you have your quality checklist or instrument need to be designed to facilitate this quality assessment. So you check. Was the methodological uh, adequately or appropriately stated? You check. Is the data analysis right? You check. Is the sampling and whatever right? You check. So that you'll be able to include it in your uh, total or the, the, the remaining article to be synthesized. So it's very important. The quality state is very important. So according to Ketchingham 2007, he constructed a quality questionnaire based on five issues affecting the study. So here, this is what the person stated in deriving or in examining the quality of the uh, literature he assessed at that time, they assessed at that time. So they said that, is the data analysis process appropriate, as I already said? Did the study carry out a sensitivity or residual analysis where accuracy statistics based on the raw data scale how good was the study comparison method? The size of the within company data set, that's if it is less than 10 projects considered poor quality. So these are the issues, these are the, 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 the 
checklist that they use in examining the quality of the article that they assess at that time. And according to Salah Ita 2011, these are also issues that he, they considered in analyzing the quality of the articles or the literature they consulted. Was the article referred, here yeah, we are talking about reviewed journals or reviewed articles. Was it reviewed by you no know, a, a, a peer review articles or not? So it's one. Where the aim of the study clearly defined, that's another criteria. Where the study participant or observational unit adequately described how they even select the participant. Was it described well? They look at that. Where the data collection carried out very well is another criteria. Where the potential confounding uh, variables adequately controlled, this one is for experimental research, whether those confounding variables were adequately controlled or not. They look at that one. Then where the approach to and formulation of the analysis were conveyed, the study was methodologically explained so that we can trust the finding. So these are the questions, these are the issues, these are the outlines, these are the indicators that they use, Salah Ita in 2011. This is what they use in assessing the quality of those articles and the literature they consulted in carrying out their systematic literature review. So ladies and gentlemen, what we are saying here is that you don't just go and carry out the published and the unpublished articles, just review any literature and come and tell us that maybe most people are willing to be basketed. No. What we are saying here is that we should go to a rigorous systematic approach. We should go through a, a quality assessment to see that those literatures, because they are the data, they are the literature that you are going to extract your data from, and you are going to synthesize their data, and out of that data that you will come out with your findings or your inferences. So if the data is not assessed to determine the quality of that article, and you just draw your inferences from that article, then you are doomed. Then it means that your inferences and your findings is going to be wrong. It's going to be misinformed. That is why there is the need for you to assess the quality of any literature that you consult before you make that synthesis and come out with your inferences. So from that, that play, we are looking at the synthesis, how you are going to synthesize your data. The key word in the systematic literature review is synthesis. So it involves collating and summarizing the results of the included primary studies. So here, key objectives of data synthesis, according to Brussels and Diaba 2011, is to analyze and evaluate multiple studies. This is key. To analyze and evaluate multiple studies before you are reviewed, like the one that we study, we have reviewed and we have gotten. 20 articles, there are multiple studies. So you need to analyze and evaluate data from these studies. Then to select appropriate methods for integrating or providing new interpretation, explanation about them. So with the synthesis, what we are talking about, you also provide appropriate method of integrating and providing new interpretation. That counts or that brings us to the types of the synthesis that we have. We have the descriptive. That is the qualitative synthesis. Then you have the numerical or the quantitative synthesis. That is the meta analysis. So we take them one after the other and explain. So when you talk about the descriptive synthesis here, it's an approach to synthesize the findings from multiple studies that relies on the use of the words and the text to summarize and explain the findings. No, the Qualitative is based on interpretivist approach. So the, 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 the philosophers are interested in words. They are interested in the meanings that we give to signals and the interaction of people. So here, they are interested in the use of words and text to summarize and explain the findings of studies from multiple studies. So they want to tell a story. So here are some methods that they use or proposed method for synthesis in qualitative study. So we have the meta ethnography, thematic analysis, content analysis, then narrative synthesis. All these things are as when further when you want to really go into 
palliative synthesis. However, the meta ethnography, as I said, the ethnography is the study of those people, their culture, the way they live, and other things. So it wants to gather a lot of articles on them and study it. Then the thematic will come in the teams who want to study that one, tell a story in the teams, you know, out of the multiple studies you have, you have reviewed. Then the content analysis, that one, you review the content. You discuss it based on the content of the uh, various articles or the multiple studies that you have reviewed. Then the narrative synthesis that we talk about, as I said, like the uh, Sunyane, the, 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 the Bono that I was talking about, now we have the MEP man, the Obri Yabua have also come out. He has also countered that history with another history, giving us a chronological and a systematic history of Ashanti before and after the Ashantis and other things. So you can also, you know, synthesize these two narratives and come out with a narrative synthesis. So that is that for the qualitative synthesis. We are moving on to the quantitative synthesis. That is the metadata analysis. Yeah, the metadata analysis can be used to aggregate results or to pull data from different studies. The aim is to resolve uncertainty when the result of studies disagrees and to increase confidence obtained from individual studies. So here, what we are saying is that different studies may come out with different results. However, you want to harness this resource. You want to harmonize it. So with the metadata analysis, you'll be able to harmonize this result from the different studies with different results. Then if you are able to do this, then it will bridge the gap and it will also increase your confidence from the obtained from the individual study. For instance, study A have come out that maybe as other people, uh, you know, people from Kumase are willing to be vaccinated. Another study have come out, maybe people in Kumase, most of them are not willing to be vaccinated. Then you have conducted another study. So you have reviewed about five or ten studies or all the studies concerning willingness in, 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 in vaccination and other things. Then you'll be able to come out and conclude based on this uh, article that you have reviewed. So maybe now four people are saying that people in Kumasi are willing. So then you come out and say that, oh, people in Kumasi are willing to be vaccinated. So when you come out, then it has boosted the confidence of these various individual studies. And then also look at the average effect side. As I said, the individual effects or the individual outcome is now boosted and the confidence is now increased by your findings. So the metadata analysis involves three basic steps. To decide which studies to be included in the meta-analysis is very key. So it also passes through the quality stage and other things. Then estimate an effect site for each individual studies to be estimated and test the combined effect. As I said, every individual like regression, we have the individual effect. So every individual study have a level of effect, have a level of confidence, have a level of you know, variation or the contribution that the person is contributing to knowledge. And it may not be the same. It may vary because they come out based on the quality of the individual study. However, with your research, since you are harmonizing these studies, at the end of the day, you'll be able to combine their effects and come out boldly. And your effect will be high as compared to the individual one. Therefore, it will also increase the confidence in the various individual studies that you have. We have software that help us you know, in the meta-analysis like the mix, the open meta, review manager, and review manager Revman from the Cochrane collaborations. Then we have our own Stata, then our console. These are all metadata that you can, uh, software that you can use to harmonize different data from different studies. And this one is mainly for quantitative studies. Let's look at how we are going to report on the findings of this review. At the end of the day, if it is for article publication and that, and then you have to first begin with the abstracts that give the snapshot of the whole process. But if it is for just a thesis presentation and that, and you start from the general uh, process that we have, that's the introduction. And in your introduction, 
you give the purpose of the review, like the problem statement or in the introduction to the study, then you emphasize on the reason why the research question is important. As is the first stage, you emphasize on that. And instead, the significance of the review work and how the project contributes to the body of knowledge. As I said, at the end of the day, your review should help us to fill gap in knowledge or in literature. So we are not just conducting the review for just conducting sake. Then the main body, the main body will look at the review method. Here we are looking at the methodology. How did you conduct the systematic literature review? We want to find out how you conducted it. So you tell us systematically how you involve it, right? the, 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 the method, the process. That's why you need to document each stage and each process, what you did, so that it will help you in you know, documenting your methodology. Then your results, you give us the results. What did you find? Then the discussion. So the discussion is mainly talking about the implication of your review. And this one is based on the research question. What did you find? It also helps us to reflect on the validity. So if your research, you pass through the systematic process and you were able to assess the quality of all these literature and everything is fine, your validity will be assured. Then the conclusion, the conclusion is also based on the research question. And it also sometimes summarizes the findings of the review question that we have. Then at times, people may blend the conclusion and the recommendation. So recommendations are being made. And here, it's happened, the recommendations are being made so that it will help us to fill the gap and it also direct us to other places that we need to look at when you talk about the systematic nature of your knowledge or the, 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 the gap in literature. It will help us know where have been filled and where it's needed to be filled or to look at. So basically, these are the processes that we go through in conducting the systematic literature with you. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to my discussion on this. So any question, any contribution, thank you. Let me, hey, let me hear from you. Any contribution, any addition and subtraction? Oscar, I'm, I'm okay. Just, just that uh -huh. Your PowerPoint was too small oh. for us to read. Oh, yeah. that's so. So next time, don't don't do it power notes. It's not PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So the next time, the, the number of um, bullets on a slide should be should be small so that we can also read. Okay. Uh, yeah. mm. Okay. So any anything on it, please. Any contribution. Any question? Yeah, Oscar. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, thank you for this. Uh, in fact, you have really touched every aspect of systematic literature review to me. Oh. What I have known so far. So I, I do have any question. I just want to thank you for this wonderful presentation. And uh, as Basi was saying that the note was uh, hot, is it? Oh, uh, the, the presentation was too, the, it was power note. <laughs> anyway, because if it doesn't do it that way too, it will be difficult for us to also, I mean, follow. But I guess that he was moving, to, to me, he was moving too fast. So wow. someone who do not have any idea, uh, basic knowledge, yeah, you, the person will be confused. Uh, that's what I've noticed, but you did a good work. Yeah, so me, I don't have any question though, but I don't know if someone has a question to ask. What can you add? What, what, what is it, or, or can you summarize anything for us on the systematic literary? Who can, who can just tell us something, can give us a snapshot about the whole process so that any layman will understand, at least take home what you have just learned, it is something. Yeah, so I, I let me let me try, please. I know it, it is just my subjective view I want to put. Yeah. You know, the, the systematic, yeah, the systematic literature yeah. review uh, is basically, um, I mean, a scientific way of writing, whereby you review 
existing works or published I mean, studies. Okay. And as you rightly said, this is not, uh, this is a little bit different from the traditional literature review that we normally do in our monographs. Yeah. This one, you have to follow the scientific way of, I mean, writing. And that is why, uh, and it's basically good when you really want to validate people's work or uh, it's another way of also reproducing what has been done to identify the gaps and also give a practical way to for, for future studies. So what economists or what, uh, I mean, the quantitative people normally do what we call the reproducibility, whereby they will replicate works. A systematic literature review is one way or the other also trying to, I mean, validate what has been done and uh, what is known and what is also not known for us to, I mean, do it. And I like systematic review in a way that it's even good for you to even develop your instrument. So for example, if you are about to conduct a study that you are not sure of variables to include, or you, do, you are not sure of what, how to develop your instrument, the systematic review is a way of identifying variables to add in your, uh, what do you call it, your instrument and variable not to add in your instrument. So this is my little knowledge, but it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, but this is my little knowledge about systematic literature review. And it also, it's also good when you are not having uh, a data, for as you rightly said that uh, during the COVID-19, people realize that it's not easy to go to the field because of the restriction that was imposed. So you can, I mean, you the systematic, uh, systematic literature review to also, I mean, come out with a very uh, interesting, I mean, story to tell the public. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Thanks. Yeah, so who again, who can also add anything to it before we wrap up and test the, is any, any additional question? At least there should be some questions. At least there are gurus on it. They can help us with any question and they can also share their views on it. So if you have anything, if anything is bothering you, please ask. Yeah, I can see big men I can see big men among us, but I don't know why they are quiet. <laughs> mm, I, don't know. I can see big men among us. Maybe they are there. Yeah. I, I, I can I can I can see uh Francis. Uh, yeah, some of them also sort of drop off, but I can see Francis. Yeah. Francis! <laughs> Francis Atta! <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they just want it. They just don't want to talk. Okay, so thank yeah. you, ladies. Oh, is he talking? Please. Francis, can we hear from you? Francis! Hello, Senior Oscar, you have done all, all the works on the systematic literature review. Uh, I want to say that we are most grateful for your time and also for your presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I also thank you for having time with you and sharing our knowledge with you. And I wish you a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. We are hoping to get the strength and the mind so that next year you organize it in a, in a proper way and show sure, there are a lot that we have to discuss and there are a lot to share so we are just hoping and hoping and praying for strength and time that we can all share with you so if you also have any idea or you want to share any information can also link up so that we will provide a platform so that we all can share and learn new things and also we review and revise ourselves on other issues that we learn and might be forgotten or maybe is it Reconnect. So that that that's just my take. Senior Bad, do you have anything for us? Any Christmas party? <laughs> <laughs> Basiru, Basiru, Basiru. <laughs> you don't have any. Uh, no, Oscar, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have anything. Produce <laughs> money. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then thank you all, eh? Okay, Charlie.